Unveil your fortunate face. Your face is full of grace. Beyond the gate of time lies a civilization with 7,000 years of celebrated heritage. A cradle of civilization. A tolerant world empire. A crossroad of civilizations. A world of artistic forms and shapes. A kaleidoscope of architectural marvels. Recreated for the first time. Iran. Seven faces of a civilization. The first region in Iran to develop a recorded history was Khuzestan. It bordered Mesopotamia and was the abode for one of the earliest civilizations on the globe. Chohamish, this huge archaeological site that is behind me, was settled around uh, 6800 BC by early farmers. It gradually developed into a major town uh, in the fourth millennium BC uh, that was administered by state organizations. Among important objects found at Chokamish are a number of seal impressions on clay balls, which have enabled us to portray different buildings and thus picture the town with the help of archaeological findings. The city was designed in such a way that administrative quarters uh, and residential quarters and workshop quarters were all separated. The alleys and the streets communicated beautifully with one another and the city had a sewer system. The largest population center in lowland Khuzestan was, however, Susa. Here, the earliest steps towards urbanization, the second great revolution in human culture, were taken by the Elamites. In my opinion, this extraordinary land, Susa, was the origin of a phenomenon in the world which we call the urban revolution. The Sumerians and Elamites had taken the fateful steps towards establishing civilization, while the rest of the world was still in the prehistoric era. Elam stretched from Anshan to Susa, from present-day Fars to Khuzestan. Almost all the techniques that formed the civilized societies were developed during the millennia after the emergence of urban centers in Mesopotamia and Iran. 
architectural innovations. Metallurgy and geometry. Invention of wheel. And even toys. And finally, abundant, intricate pottery with beautiful designs. As economic interaction intensified, the subsequent need to record and store information eventually paved the way for the development of writing. While the formation of cities marked the beginning of civilization, the invention of writing separates history from prehistory. And thus began the history of mankind. Elam, in the period between the 13th to 12th centuries BC, under its most powerful king, Untash Naperisha, reached its zenith. Overlooking the river Diz, he made a holy city called Dur Untash, what we may call Untashburg, the present day Choga Zanbil. A glorious ziggurat of a hundred by a hundred meters occupies the center of this royal and religious city. It consisted of five stages with a total height of more than 50 meters. Here, priests would conduct religious ceremonies while sacrifices were offered on special platforms. The importance of women in the Elamite society is indicated by this unique and monumental life-size statue of the Elamite queen, Napirasu, the spouse of Untash Napirisha. Weighing more than 1,750 kilograms, it was unrivaled even in Egypt or Babylon. Sculpture and metallurgy were advanced to a new height in the first millennium BC by the incoming tribes who had just established themselves in the Zagros Mountains in Luristan. To me, the fascination is that they are so unusual and they're so alive and vigorous beautiful metal work. To make one of the most elaborate Luristan bronzes, you have to make a wax model first. Then you, you cover the wax with clay, you bake the clay so it's hard, and the wax in the inside melts out. And then you pour the bronze into the, the space left by the wax, so that each one is unique. You can only do it once. In 646 BC, the Elamite civilization was shattered by Ashur Banipal, king of Assyria. The Iranian tribes, on the other hand, eventually defeated the Assyrians and for the first time in history formed a noble and tolerant world empire. The Achaemenid Empire. The 
best known representatives of the Iranian tribes who had migrated and settled on the Iranian plateau were the Medes and the Persians, speaking an Indo-European language ancestral to modern Persian. The Iranian tribes, while absorbing the millennia-old art tradition of the Near East, gave it a new invigorating flavor and value. This could be seen in the findings from the sites in Malik, Hassanlu and Ziviyer in present-day Gilan, Azerbaijan and Kurdistan. In 559 BC, Cyrus, one of those rare leaders towards whom one cannot help but gravitate, unified the Medes and the Persians and initiated what had never been achieved before, the first tolerant world empire. The greatest symbol of Persian tolerance is evident in the Cyrus Cylinder, an inscription found in 1879 at Babylon, sometimes referred to as the Cyrus Bill of Human Rights. Tolerance was the key word in religions in this vast Achaemenid Empire. We all know how Cyrus freed the Jews from captivity in Babylonia so they could return to their homelands in Palestine. But this was not the only case. It happened later in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah as officers of the king who came back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. They did the same thing in Egypt and in Babylonia and among the Greeks of Asia Minor. In fact, they are the first example of international religious freedom that we find in the history of mankind. Because of biblical references to Cyrus, he was for centuries regarded as a model of a good ruler. Some Muslim scholars also find Zulkanain in the Quran to be a reference to Cyrus. In celebration of his victories, Cyrus elected an elaborate royal park in his capital city, Pasagarde, which became the model for Persian gardens. Since we had got two large rectangles, if we divided it with the vision of power, we got four parterres, or a chaharbakh. This is one of those very important Persian discoveries in design, which the world has taken as a model, and was taken uh, eventually to India and to Spain, The most brilliant Achaemenid king in administration was Darius the Great, who brought the empire to its pinnacle. In Egypt, he built a canal between the Red Sea and the Nile, anticipating the modern Suez Canal. At the same time, a great highway of 1,600 miles, stretching from Susa to the Mediterranean shores, was devised. Using this road, an efficient courier service, a forerunner of the Pony Express, was introduced. 
To regulate the social and economic life of the empire, taxes were systemized and weights, measures and monetary units standardized to simplify commercial exchange. In many ways, the Persian Empire was responsible for transmitting a myriad of cultural and technological achievements of the Near East to the Greco-Roman civilization. Darius the Great, whom Plato has praised as the lawgiver, established a code of law known as the Ordinance of Good Regulations which were carried into all distant lands. In fact, at this time, a new word for law appeared in the whole Near East, the Iranian data, which was borrowed by Armenian, Hebrew, and Akkadian languages. This papyrus from Egypt bears a legal text under Pharaoh Darius and this clay tablet is a contract for leasing of a house in the fifth year of Darius the Great's reign. Some 2,500 years ago, Persepolis was the sumptuous capital of the great Persian Empire, which according to Diodorus Siculus, was the richest city under the sun. Reminiscent of the vastness of the Persian Empire are the 23 groups of gift bearers from all over the empire depicted on the Persepolis reliefs. Here, the dignitaries from all over the empire gathered for New Year's celebrations. Coming up to Apadana, the visitor is quite impressed by the size of the columns, which were about 20 meters high. Then, passing through the giant doors that were 18 meters high, he would enter the huge audience hall. His heart is beating faster and faster. He can see a forest of columns, the multicolor carpets on the floor, a huge ornamented roof, And finally, in the background, he would ultimately see the king himself seated on his throne. Unfortunately, in 330 BC, in an act of vandalism, Persepolis was destroyed by the fire kindled by Alexander and his Macedonian army. Thus, the richest city under the sun was no more. Only seven years after the fall of Persepolis, Alexander died in 323 BC. Hence his successors, known as the Seleucids, ruled over Iran for more than a century. Eventually, the Parthians, a Persian-speaking tribal confederation from the northeast, drove the Seleucids out of the Iranian territories and ruled for almost four centuries. The earliest Iranian contact with Christianity took place during this era 
when three wise men, or Parthian priests, traveled from Iran to Nazareth to pay homage to the infant Jesus. Consequently, Christianity has had almost 2,000 years of history in the Iranian cultural climate. The Parthians were eventually challenged by an ambitious and powerful governor of Fars, Ardeshir Papakan. In 224 AD, Ardeshir established the new Sasanian dynasty, named after his grandfather, Sasan. It was a time um, that was, of course, to lead under the Parthians and Sasanians to a point where the Zoroastrian religion became the religion of Iran. Uh, the king was, in a sense, um, the representative of Ahura Mazda, the, the voice of the god, uh, the person who kept the balance between the forces of good and evil. Kingship and the religion were one entity. Traditionally, Zoroaster is believed to have lived sometime between 900 and 800 BC. Zoroastrianism is still practiced in some parts of Iran and India. Sasanian kings were known as city builders. Ardashir's special and unparalleled heritage is the radiant layout of his town. Ardashir Hure, or the glory of Ardashir, which spreads beyond the city wall and all over the plain, like the 20 spokes of a gigantic wheel. It was two kilometers in diameter, with its 40 meters high tower in the center as a symbol of God-given centralistic kingship. The location of the Sasanian Empire between the Far East and Europe had made it not only the link between East and West, but according to J. Damestetter, as the spiritual bridge for humanity and a crossroad of civilizations. Through this crossroad, Iranian works of art reached the far corners of the known world. For over a millennium, Iranian merchants dominated trade between China and Europe through the Silk Road, centuries before Marco Polo set foot on Chinese soil. A precious commodity was the Sasanian glassware. This is an interesting uh, craft because, of course, these are very breakable, and so they're very, very valuable. So that. Uh, when you find a piece of beautiful uh, glassware, let's say in Jerusalem or anywhere else in Palestine or even Egypt, and it's identifiable as Sasanian, you have to think this came a long way at great expense and was highly prized. This was something that they mastered the technique of, of, of making these things and it was transported throughout the world. They influence to the many cultural heritage, and the Japanese emperor Shomu loved Iranian specimens: carpet, glassware, music instrument, etc. This marvelous Sasanian glass tray, now at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, depicts the Sasanian king, Anushirvan. Anushirvan is celebrated for his great Ivan, 
known as the Taki Kasra in Tessifon. This great Ivan was originally about 50 meters in length, 26 meters in width, and 37 meters in height to the top of the vault. Wider than any vault in Europe, the French traveler Pascal Coast remarked that the Romans had nothing similar to it. The Sasanian period was a high point for luxurious life in antiquity. From feasting to hunting, playing musical instruments to playing chess and polo. Sasanian kings had a special interest in depicting their glorious moments in silver dishes as well as rock reliefs. The image of two animals facing one another is a special feature of Sasanian art. Although this textile you see here was discovered in Egypt, it actually belongs to Sasanian Iran. Here you can see the mythical animals facing each other as well as peacocks. A lot of similar textiles were taken to Europe and they undoubtedly had an effect on Byzantine textiles. The influence of Sasanian motifs can be seen on the external wall of the 12th century AD church of Saint-Étienne in Beauvais, France, and on the textiles from Italy, Spain, and even remote places in the Far East, such as Japan. The reign of Sasanians is distinguished by their numerous encounters with Rome, followed by Byzantium. Various wars between these two powers exhausted both sides and made them vulnerable to a new rising force. By the middle of the 7th century, the Sasanian Empire had been weakened considerably because of wars with Byzantium, internal corruption, high taxation, the caste system had wearied the people, so they were ready to accept a new revolution, the coming of Islam and Islamic troops into the Fertile Crescent and into Iran. Utter unity, no unity. In this is to be summarized the trunk and branches of the tree of faith. Islam brought a revelation which like a rain poured upon the soil of the soul of the Iranian people who because of many uh, factors, including the rise of Manichaeism and Mazdaism and during the Sasanid period and many uh, social and religious and political events, were ready for the reception of this new message. Iranians created a very major civilization before the rise of Islam. But the intellectual aspect of Persian civilization flowered with the coming of Islam. To a people and a religion open to the world for novel ideas, the Iranians brought a unique gift, the experiences of an ancient and well-established civilization which the Arab rulers eagerly incorporated, including the ways to govern, to collect taxes and to establish monumental architecture and art.
The Bam Citadel in southeastern Iran is the largest and oldest mud brick city in the world. Here, before the devastating 2003 earthquake, distinct sectors were noticeable that could give us a relatively clear picture as to how the early Islamic cities in Iran might have looked. It consisted of the residential quarter that included a hypostyle mosque without a dome and a long bazaar, all enclosed by the main rampart. Then there was the governor's quarters on the hill, enclosed by another wall. A brilliant contribution of Iranian engineers was the development of the dome. As can be seen at the remains of the Ardashir Palace near Firuzabad, the inventive Iranian engineers had solved the question of putting a round dome on a square base by inventing squinches. Thus, in the Islamic period, the use of domes in the building of mosques started in Iran and spread to the whole Islamic world. Prophet Muhammad's decree for both men and women to learn and acquire knowledge from cradle to the grave encouraged Muslims to pursue learning. From the 9th century onwards, many Iranian Muslims became prominent figures in medicine and other disciplines. The greatest of these figures were Razi and Avicenna. Razi, known as Razis in the West, is also credited with the isolation of alcohol and its use in medicine as an antiseptic. Razi was the first physician to write a treatise on pediatrics. This is the resting place of Avicenna. A thousand years ago, Avicenna was one of the world's leading figures in philosophy, medicine and pharmacology. His medical treatises, known as Canon, was a basic text at Oxford and Montpellier as late as the 17th century. The Europäische Wissenschaft since in those times the church had banned research and studies, science was under great pressure in Europe. When the achievements of Islamic scholars in various sciences reached Europe through translated books from Spain, Sicily, or by students in Cordoba, then science began to progress here. Therefore, Islamic scholars were the purveyors of science in Europe. In mathematics, charasmi, from whence we get the word logarithm and algorithm, introduced algebra to Europe, as well as the decimal system of numerals instead of Roman numerals. while Omar Khayyam classified the forms of cubic equations. And Biruni did pioneering works in geography and empirical physics. Ibn Khaldun, the 14th century Arab philosopher of history, has thus recapitulated this development. Most Muslim scholars, both in religious and intellectual sciences, were Persians. Thus, the truth of the statement of the Prophet becomes apparent. 
If learning was suspended at the highest parts of heaven, the Persians would attain it. Iranians played a major role in the development of Islamic civilization, yet they preserved much of their cultural heritage, including the Persian language. As a result, by the second half of the 9th century, a number of local dynasties that emerged in the eastern part of Iran, mainly in the Khorasan region, became the proponents of Persian poetry and literature. This trend continued even when the Seljuks, a large nomadic clan of Turkic origin, pushed through Iran in the 11th century. They were eventually transformed into the rulers of a centralized state under the influence of Iranian administrative institutions already in place. All the politics, financial and administrative institutions had been created by the able officers clergy and uh, bureaucracy of Iranians. The top model of this was Nizam al-Mulk. His siyaset name became almost a constitution for centuries for Turks and other Islamic peoples. Two centuries before the first European university was founded at Bologna, Nizam al-Mulk for the first time established universities with a unique campus system at Nishapur, Isfahan and other major cities. They gave rewards to people, to the students who did very well and, and achieved a certain degree such that they gave them robes of honor and uh, even talisman caps and I uh, think that it's fairly generally agreed that this is the origin of the cap and gown which you wear in Western universities when you get degrees, when you finish your course of study, that it goes back for, well, almost a thousand years to the East. Persian poetry is unique in the world for its depth, richness and creativity. And there is an intimate mingling of Persian mysticism and Persian literature. The love for, for poetry is extraordinary and there is no other country in the world that I know of which would have the same love for, for literature. The greatest monument of Persian epic poetry is Ferdowsi's masterpiece, the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings, comparable to Homer's Iliad. A thousand years after its creation, the Shahnameh is still easily understood by the Persian-speaking general public. When I was young, and I was a classics major at the time, I loved Homer, I went to a museum and I saw the illuminations from the Shahnameh and decided any text that generated such gorgeous illuminations had to be read in the middle, which is why I've given my life to reading the Shahnameh. Sophistication and sublimity finds no limit in the Iranian miniature paintings which usually adorn the dazzling manuscripts of Iranian poetry. When one reads a page or two of Nazami's, he immediately feels an inclination for painting. Since Nazami had an extraordinary talent for storytelling and imagination, in his works, color, movement and story are all visualized. In fact, in all four essential features of the art of the book, calligraphy, bookbinding, illumination and illustration, the Iranian artists reach the peak of perfection. In the art of the books, there is a very uh, precise construction in the beginning, you see. 
And in the ornamentation, you have a very solid uh, preparation of a geometrical design. Selection of the style of calligraphy and the type of pen itself for each text was an art in itself. Another interesting art was Iranian bookbinding that was copied even in Europe. Certain Renaissance Italian bookbinding done in Venice was in fact copied from the method prevalent in Iran. And it's even possible to say that the bookbinder himself was from the city of Tabriz in Iran. This is one of the most exquisite methods in the West up to the present day. Persian mystical poetry reached its pinnacle in the works of Jalaladin Rumi. Rumi's considerable intellectual and poetic skills infused his poetry with delight, ecstasy and spiritual zest. His greatest work is known as the Masnavi. He was a person who was a great scholar. I mean, almost all the streams of Islamic thought before him flow into the Masnavi, but transformed mystically. Maulana Jalaluddin was also given by God the incredible gift of appreciating every form of beauty as the beauty of God. The famous hadith of the Prophet, alayhi salatu wa salam, Allahu jameelun yuhabbu jamal, that is God is beautiful and he loves beauty, marks the whole being of Jalaluddin. When we think of the most popular moralist in Persian literature, Sadi comes to mind. He writes, The sons of Adam are the limbs of one body, created of one essence. When time pained one limb, the others can find no peace. Thou, who hast no sympathy for the troubles of others, art unworthy of the name human. From India to the Balkans, the poetry of Hafez, the story of love, beauty and unselfishness, enjoyed great popularity. Hafez, Hafez is the prince of Persian lyric poetry. He believed that man's selfishness is responsible for all his sufferings. Thus, Egoism is the bondage from which one has to be liberated. What Hafez saw in his days was selfishness, misery, war and bloodshed. Yet, like alchemy, he transformed these inputs into golden melodies and spiritual taverns of celestial wine. Be a passionate pilgrim of the pass of love. And behold, what blessings shall come thy way in this journey. Calm and prosperity which provided the fertile ground for the development of such works of art was abruptly shaken by the brutal forces of Genghis Khan, known as the Mongols, followed by Tamerlane. In the 13th and 14th century, just like the strong winds from the east, two invasions almost destroyed the nation. But like a cypress tree, 
which bends to the ground in the wind and then returns, so did Iran and its culture. When you look at history of Iran and suddenly you realize that constantly there were invaders coming. From the west, it was Alexander the Great and the Arabs. From the east, it, it were the Turks and the Mongols. You realize that Iran shouldn't have existed on the map of history for centuries, for millennia. It should have been wiped out completely because it is on the crossroad of all the civilizations and the battlefield for many armies. But Iran is still alive and kicking and well. How is it possible? All those invaders who came on the Iranian plateau, they were so attracted to Iranian way of life to Iranian civilization, to the beauty of, of music, the beauty of poetry, the beauty of miniature, the beauty of Persian cuisine, that within a very short period, they tried and wanted to become Iranian, Persian. As these coins testify, the Mongols gradually turned to Islam, which became the official religion of their ruling dynasty known as the Ilkhanids. They, like the Seljuks, found out that they cannot rule without the help of Iranian ministers or viziers. The northwestern Iranian city of Tabriz was chosen as their capital. Marco Polo, who had visited Tabriz at that time, thus describes it. A great city surrounded by beautiful and pleasant gardens. It is excellently situated so that goods are brought to here from many regions. Latin merchants, especially Genoese, go there to buy the goods that come from foreign lands. Here, the famous Iranian vizier, Rashiduddin Hamadani, created an entire suburb called Rabi Rashidi, employing within it scholars, doctors and craftsmen. Rashiduddin's foundation act for this city of science reveals that it was well planned and included 24 caravanserai, or inns, 1,500 shops, 30,000 houses and textile and paper manufacturing workshops. A special zone was allotted to housing scientists and physicians invited from across the world to work at Rabi Rashidi's International Hospital. Beginning in the 13th century, colorful tile decoration becomes very prominent in the decoration of palaces in Iran. It becomes kind of a decorative sheath for the interior of buildings. This could be seen at Sultanye, the landmark of the new Ilkhanid king, Sultan Mohammed's capital city. Now in ruins, it might have looked like this when it was intact. Perhaps the boldest innovation of this building is the corona of eight minarets. André Godard thus described it. The blue dome 
vivid and gleaming with its brilliant crown of minarets, seems to float in the sky. Here is a dome with a span of 80 feet, built solely of bricks, which stands simply by virtue of a perfectly conceived and constructed profile. According to studies by an Italian team headed by Professor Piero San Paolesi from the University of Florence, the plan and structure of the Great Dome at Saltagne has had a direct impact on the design and construction of the Church of Santa Maria del Fiore in the city of Florence. After the second wave of invasion by Tamerlane and the power struggle which followed by his successors, the country was divided between different sultans and petty kings. It was now the right time for the emergence of a unified Iran. At the beginning of the 16th century, the semi-nomadic Turkmen Shia tribes of Anatolia and northwestern Iran, with their charismatic leader Ismail the Safavid, gradually gained control over Iran. Subsequently, the extraordinary revival of Iranian civilization took shape and an invigorating culture flourished. The most distinguished of the Safavid rulers was Shah Abbas, who came to the throne in 1587. During his rule, an Englishman, Sir Robert Shirley, trained the Safavid army in the use of artillery. With this new force, Shah Abbas drove back the Uzbeks in the northeast and the Ottomans in the northwest. The Safavid rule was manifested by two important developments. First, the re-emergence of a nation-state as the core of an empire. Second, the consolidation of Shi'i Islam as the national religion of the country. Neither Sunnism nor Shiism was invented by the Persians, as some Orientalists have claimed. They are already to be seen even in the lives of the Prophet when the Prophet himself referred to certain people as Shia al-Ali. They were people whom the Prophet recognized as sort of the party of Ali, even during his own lifetime. Certain places, like the city of Qom, like Sabzavar, places are from the very beginning centers of Shiism. And especially when the Ahlul Bayt, many of them migrated to Iran as a result of the persecutions under the Umayyads in Iraq and also the early Abbasid period, of course, culminating with the journey of the eighth Shiite Imam, Imam Rada alayhi salam, to Khorasan, where he's now buried. For political and economic considerations, Shah Abbas relocated his capital from Kazvin to Isfahan in the heartland of the Iranian plateau and by the Zayandirud, or the life-giving river. struck when I go to Esfahan by a sense of the magic of the place. I 
think it's an architecture that has a wonderful capacity for theatricality, for orchestrating climaxes. Think of these huge surfaces which are smoothed out so that they can act as picture galleries for separate panels of tile decoration. You are meant to look at that, to walk from panel to panel, to drink them in, to contemplate them. I think that's the great strength of Safavid architecture. Under the Safavids, the textile industry flourished and became a key factor in establishing economic prosperity. The paintings on the Chehil Sotun, or 40 Columns Pavilion, not only depict the musical instruments of the period, they also serve as a reference to the clothing and textiles of the era. Safavid textiles are one of the truly great developments in Iranian art over the centuries. And, and we are talking about, of course, an art tradition of extraordinary ambition and achievement over millennia, not just a few centuries, but over millennia. So it's something that we, we have to take, a, I think, a great humility when we, when we look at the accomplishments of this artistic tradition. The silk trade was boosted by the Armenian craftsmen and merchants transferred from Julfa in Azerbaijan to a suburb of Isfahan named the New Julfa. Relative religious tolerance, especially for Christians, was a feature of the Safavid rule. Accordingly, during the reign of the Safavid kings, 14 churches, including the famous Vank Cathedral, were built in Isfahan. This was accentuated in Jean Chardin's writings. Chardin, who was in Iran from the 1660s, analyzed everything very carefully. At that time, Europe was witnessing a long-standing religious strife among Catholics and Protestants. And since Shada himself was a Protestant, one major topic in his book of travels was freedom of religion, which he'd found in Iran of the Safavid era. And the root and origin of the idea of religious tolerance in 18th century France was in fact inspired by Chardin's book of travels. Following the footsteps of Cyrus the Great, Shah Abbas devised the Chahabak Promenade. This four-kilometer-long public park, the longest in Iranian architectural history, with sequences of gardens, monumental balconies, and a canal at the center for conducting water through ornamented pools, overwhelmed everyone. At the very end of the 17th century, the Iranian artists and craftsmen succeeded in re-establishing Iran's long-lasting tradition with beautification of the surrounding world. In terms of shapes, I would say without hesitating that no country in the world has anything like remotely the diversity 
a number of shapes that were created in the Iranian world from 2000 BC down to the 19th century. And you can see how they develop continuously. Creators of this illuminating array of beauty are amongst the world's greatest artists who splendidly guide us towards the source of all beauty and in the words of Rumi, toward that land of peace where questioning cease. My soul turned its face to that happy place, the land of peace where questionings cease. The mystery that till now from me a thousand veils concealed, my soul revealed. <laughs> 